Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to uh, Mechanics uh, Social. This is Abel Talamantes, Chess Director of the Mechanics Institute, and we have Dr. Judith Stare, who's the uh, General Manager of the club. And today, uh, kicking off our, uh, our Friday Social, uh, we have uh, International Master and former uh, Mechanics Institute uh, Chess Director, John Donaldson. Uh, thank you, John, for joining us. Oh, I'm happy to be here. So uh, how are you doing with all the uh, shelter in place? Are you in Berkeley? Are you in St. Louis? I'm in Berkeley, and uh, I, uh, I'm finding uh, endless project, chess project. <laughs> well, the thing, I, I guess we're, we're a little bit fortunate in our business because, you know, Judith and I have been talking how uh, since we've been like a month since the building is closed, we've actually been even more busy than when we were actually there. <laughs> and uh, so I guess kind of the nature of the, when you're in the chess business, uh, sheltering in place, there's still a lot to do. Uh, and certainly the case for us is we've been transitioning a lot of stuff online. Uh, so you've been very busy. What have you been busy doing? You working on a book or you I, I am uh, just finishing uh, the first volume of a uh, two uh, book series on uh, Bobby Fischer, and it'll be published by uh, Silman James Press, the ones that uh, published like uh, Reassess Your Chess. Oh, wow. Uh, Amateur's Mind. Like Jeremy Silman. Yeah. yeah, and it's it'll be about 500 pages, and it's wow. uh, questions that I always had about Bobby Fischer that I wanted to, you know, I couldn't find answers elsewhere, and I tried to answer them to, you know, to the best of my satisfaction. Uh, so that's what the first volume will be. But the uh, thing I've been working on uh, more of late uh, is about six years ago, uh, uh, Jim Tarjan, who I'm sure many mechanics members know, not only did he play a lot of mechanics six years ago, uh, but he uh, has more recently been starring in uh, online. Uh, he uh, 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 and I were talking and I mentioned how few of his games were in the mega database, you know, prior to his first retirement, which was in 1984. And so uh, I told him if he just brought his games to uh, the mechanics, I would arrange to have them entered. And uh, with the help of Elliot Winslow and uh, Daniel Naroditsky and, uh, and uh, Andy Ansel, who's like a really great chess database expert and a former mechanics member, the three of them uh, really helped me a lot. And uh, uh, I, you know, it's sort of been a trip down memory lane, seeing his games against, you know, Vince McCambridge and Nick DeFermi and, you know, as they were coming up and so uh, regulars. Yeah. great pleasure and almost done. Fantastic. Yeah, actually, uh, it, it was kind of like a surprise. I think uh, James Tarjan reached out sort of, you know, he started playing some of our online events and uh, now he's he's been kind of like our, our superstar uh, he had a great game against uh, Shabalov, and actually we're uh, we're organizing a big round robin next week, and he's agreed to be our our board one. So uh, it's a lot of fun to see him, you know, fully engaged and you know representing mechanics. Yeah, well, the thing about Jim is I knew he always had a great career, but I did not realize just how outstanding it was. He uh, played five times for the U.S. Olympiad team. And pretty much every one of those teams medaled. He won several individual gold medals. And his uh, lifetime percentage score uh, is like, you know, in the vicinity of 75%. So he and Sam Shanklin, I believe, are like in the top, certainly the top five all-time U.S. Olympiad team performers. And that goes back to like the 1920s. I think only Cashton is clearly a little bit ahead of them. Uh, so... Uh, Jim was rated in the top 50 players in the world in the early 1980s. And, uh, you know, he took second in the 1978 U.S. Championship. So this is a guy who could really play. So I've been really impressed with him. He had a very active, dynamic style, very modern style. He played both E4 and D4 with White. Uh, so it's been a real pleasure. And hopefully I've, I've learned a little bit, too, in doing this. No, fantastic. And, and it, it's it's kind of surprising and inspiring, too, that, at, at his age, because he's probably in his late 60s, I think. Um, he's, he's playing, he seems to be playing at a high level with, with vigor, with youthful vigor. Um, what, what does that get attributed to? Is it just kind of the passion for, that he has for chess? Well, he has a real love for the game. He definitely has a love for the game. And I'm, I'm sure 
that everybody also recalls, you know, his beating Vladimir Kramnik. And, and that wasn't just a, a one-off game in that tournament. He had a performance about 26.40 feet a. And, you know, the only other American player I can think of, you know, you know, 65 and older that's had a result like that is uh, Sammy Ruszewski. So, you know, this is, you know, he's, he's had a career that deserves to put him in the U.S. Chess Hall of Fame. So going back to the book that you're working on, on Bobby Fischer, you were kind of mentioning that you wanted to write something where you were exploring questions that you were always curious about that hadn't been written about or, or touched on. What kind of questions are those? Are, are, it about, are they about his, his play? Is it about his life? or? It's about everything. To give you a couple examples, one, in 1965, he was invited to play in the Capablanca Memorial in Havana. And he really uh, was looking forward to this. It was a really, really strong tournament. It had been held a a couple of years in a row. But the problem was the U.S. State Department wouldn't give him permission to visit Cuba. You know, this is a time when the Cold War was really uh, at its height. And uh, so that was not going to be an option. And the year before, Larry Evans had played. And he had snuck in. He'd flown from Canada. But after he came back to the United States, he had a number of, of visits by people in dark suits with dark shoes and asking him a lot of questions. <laughs> Bobby didn't want the you know, FBI coming by. So he, he said, oh, I'm sorry, I have to decline the invitation. But as, of course, as we all know, uh, uh, somebody came up with this brilliant idea that he could play by uh, telex. And so for the better part of a month, uh, he was sort of the first... Uh, guy to uh, really uh, shelter in place, if you will, for a chess tournament. You know, he had to sit there for a month and, you know, of course, technology wasn't great. So the games, because of the transmission delays were, you know, they were like seven, eight hours a session. And one of the games he played was against a Romanian uh, future grandmaster by the name of Victor uh, Chukotea. I'm probably butchering this pronunciation, so my apologies to any of our Romanian listeners. Uh, but in this game, if you look it up online, it starts off e4, knight f6 in Fisher's black. And everybody always wondered, like, it's kind of strange. Like, Fisher, like, what's he doing playing Elekind's defense? He should be playing, you know, you know, the knight or f4, or maybe e4, e5, we get a brief phase. Uh, he had played the Elekind's once before, uh, at least once before he played it against Duncan Suttles, but... Suttles was a guy who always favored closed positions and wasn't a theoretician, except for in his own special openings. So they sort of figured that was just like a one-off. So the question was, what really happened in that game with Chuck Tate in the opening? And there's always been this sort of urban legend that there was a transmission error at the beginning of the game. And so I, I contacted about a half dozen New Yorkers that were there. And indeed, what happened was... Uh, the first move was relayed as e4, and Bobby played knight f6. And and then, the, excuse me, the first move was relayed as d4, and and Bobby played knight f6. And the next move was e5. And so then immediately they realized there was a problem. You know, obviously, you know, Chukotea played e4. He didn't play d4. Uh, so they didn't. They asked Bobby. They said we have this problem, and they were kind of mortified. Like, what's going to happen? He's going to ask to have. Uh, the, the game start over again, and and the rules for that tournament were drafted on kind of on the fly and weren't so well developed, so they, they could anticipate there could be problems. But Molly said no problem, and so he just played Elekinds. I mean, you know, it wasn't part of his you know normal opening repertoire, but he knew knew so much about so many different openings he could just play it. So that was like one little thing I could just check off, if you will. It's uh, it's relieving to hear because I play the Alakine, so it's it's nice to hear Bobby Fischer playing it. Well, he even played in the World Championships, so you know, he definitely considered it, you know, open worthy. So, how are you doing your your research uh, sheltered in place? I mean, uh, you must be able to use a lot of online resources to access information. Or well, do you yourself have just a lot of your own research? I well, I do, I do have a, a, a reasonably good uh, personal library. I mean, for this Tarzan uh, project, for example, uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, all the issues of uh, a lot of California publications, both Southern and Northern California, which, by the way, we also have at the Mechanics Library in the reference section. 
And so I could look up ratings and confirm round numbers and, uh, you know, things of that sort. For Fisher, it's been a little bit different by and large because I've done most of the research already. Now it's more a question of just uh, uh, rewriting and, and, and uh, uh, trying to, to get down on, on, on the screen what I, I want to say. But, uh, but one thing I did learn uh, this year, uh, at least I think I have a better understanding of it, is there's always been this question, you know, who was Bobby Fischer's teacher? You know, the guy who's on the very shortest list to be the greatest player of all time. Who, who taught him? And, uh, of course, you know, a couple of years ago at the Mechanics, you know, we had one person that said that they were his teacher. It was uh, William Lombardi. And uh, as he explained in his book uh, that he wrote a couple of years ago uh, before his death, uh, he said that, you know, he was the one that interacted, you know, with Bobby from about the age of 10 to... 13, and that, and that was really uh, the critical time for Bobby, and that's really where he, 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 he made his huge jump forward uh, up to about age 15 when he became a candidate for the World Championship. So that's, that's, that's certainly one candidate. Uh, Lombardi made it very clear that he thought that uh, John Collins, who uh, was one of Fisher's mentors, we'll use that word for a moment, uh, uh, didn't really have that big a role to play. Uh, and, uh, you know, the question was, you know, who's right? Or, well, the first thing is that it's interesting that Collins never claimed to be his teacher. But what Collins did do is, is that for two years, uh, basically between about 1956, the summer of 56 to the summer of 58, when Bobby went off to play in the candidates, uh, Collins made his home Bobby's second home. And Collins' home was one block from the high school that Bobby went to, Erasmus High School. And so Bobby, at lunchtime, would just run over to Collins' place. And, and Collins lived with his sister. Uh, he, Collins had some serious physical challenges that uh, prevented him being very mobile, but, but chess was, a, was ideal for him. And so... At lunchtime, you know, Collins would greet Bobby and he would, uh, uh, his, uh, Collins' uh, sister, uh, Edith, had prepared some uh, uh, sandwiches for him and they'd sit down and look at chess for an hour. Then Bobby would run back to the school. Bobby wow. sit there for a couple hours. Then he'd come back to Collins' place and he'd just be there for like, you know, from, you know, three or four in the afternoon until 10 o'clock when uh, Regina Fisher would get off work and, uh, and pick him up. And... And how about how old was would he have been? He would have been. Uh, he was born in forty three, so he this was between ages thirteen and fifteen. Wow! And uh, they had an apartment that was on the ground floor, and it was pretty good size, and it was a it was a de facto or a chess salon, if you will. Collins had a big library. He was a big correspondence player. He was, he was like a twenty four hundred USCF rated player. And he would uh, uh, go over games with Bobby. He played blitz with Bobby. And then a, a host of strong players would come and visit, like on Friday nights or on the weekends. And so Bobby was just like, you know, just sort of breathing in the chess, if you will. And, this, and so Colin said, I, I was never his teacher, but I think a strong argument can be made that he played a vital role in providing this, this atmosphere for him. Uh, I don't think Lombardi was actually Fisher's teacher for a couple of weeks, but I think, again, he played a very important role. But the person who was really Bobby's teacher uh, is the person that he credits in his first book he wrote, you know, Bobby Fisher's Games of Chess that came out in 1959. And that was a fellow by the name of uh, Carmen uh, uh, Nigro. And uh, Nigro worked with Bobby from when he was about eight or nine years old till when he was about 12 years old. And so we're not talking about the time when Fisher was like a master or the international master or grandmaster. We're talking about from, you know, near beginner to about 1700 player. And I remember reading that uh, dedication, but it never quite hit me. You know, I just thought it was something nice he did at the time to acknowledge the help he received. Uh, but uh, many years later, while researching this book, I uh, ran across a deposition that Bobby Fisher gave to uh, a legal firm 
when he was suing Time Warner for the uh, Bobby Fischer versus the world of Brad Derrick book. And in there, you know, when they give depositions, you know, they, they search around, they ask questions here, there, and everywhere, and it goes on forever. And one of the questions they asked him was, he said, well, who's your chess teacher? And why they would have asked that question, I don't know, except for they're probably getting paid by the hour. And so uh, they asked, and uh, Fisher said, well, you know, I don't know if I had really had a teacher, in a, but in a way it was this guy, Carmen Nigro. Well, wow. I had a chance uh, earlier this year to sp speak to his son, and his son, Tommy, was one of the kids that uh, uh, Nigro taught on Saturday mornings. Bobby was part of this group of young kids. I mean, they were really pretty far ahead of their time, if you will, for Scholastic. Yeah. And, uh, uh, of course, Nigro said after about an hour, all of us went out and ran outside and we wanted to play stickball. Except, <laughs> baseball, you know? yeah. but, except for Bobby. Bobby would stay there the whole day with my father. And, uh, and then he showed me, uh, uh, he shared some images with me of, uh, of the books that he had that his father used. And was, there were books like Practical Chess Openings by Ruben Fine and Basic yeah. Endings by Ruben Fine. And, and it turns out that... Not chess the Easy Way? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All those, all, that. Those books, all those books, first, there weren't that many books at the time. But uh, Nigro was a, a latecomer to chess. He only learned after he was in the military during the Second World War. So... Wow. Uh, was in his 20s when he took up the game, but he still got to be like, you know, a good expert rated player. And he had, uh, uh, he was a real believer in book learning. And so I think that this is probably one of the ways that, you know, you, you know, Bobby became exposed to chess literature and started to develop his love for it. And it also explains why one thing I always thought was very odd for Fisher and in one interview or maybe in his boys life column, I'm not sure exactly where it was, Somebody asked him, like, some advice, like, what book would you go through? And, and remember, this is, like, maybe, like, in the late 60s. There weren't so many options in English. And he said, uh, modern chess openings. Just start at the beginning and go through all of it. And I thought, this is strange <laughs> advice. I mean, you know, young players or, you know, any, any student, you know, you're, you're not supposed to, like, go through uh, opening books. Uh, but he was just saying, you know, go through the whole, you know, MCO, it's kind of like they give the first 20 moves of the game. And so he was just saying, go through that. And when you're finished, start up again. And I, I can't help but think that that must have been, you know, the, the approach that Nigro used. And somehow that's with Bobby. Speaking so, of uh, openings, uh, Judith's telling me in the chat that there's a lot of viewers that dislike the outcomes. <laughs> as we, we mentioned it. Well, I, I, I mean, certainly, um, if you think of nowadays, of like what they just do, but be like the correct openings, you know, I mean, I would say, you know, E4, E5, certain variations of the Sicilian, like the Knight or the Sveshnikov, or, or, you know, those are like the, the front line, and then maybe, you know, French and Cairo Khan are coming next, and then maybe Elokine from there would appear, but I can guarantee you this, Elokine's defense is completely fine for playing the Tuesday night night. <laughs> That's right. Actually, speaking of the Tuesday Night Marathon, I wanted to transition to kind of chess in today's time because uh, there's kind of like two things. You know, we, you know, we've been doing a lot of online and kind of keeping our regulars together to our online club, which is, which is really neat. But, you know, we're also preparing for what, you know, chess will look like when we reopen because I know one of the things people are going to be very conscious of are uh, social distancing measures, and uh, we think it's going to impact the Tuesday Night Marathon because we may not be able to, uh, uh, you know, accommodate the, the 100, 120 that we usually do. So we're kind of like already thinking of strategies of, you know, holding it on a Tuesday and a Thursday and setting a limit of how many players, just things of that nature. But, like, what, what do you, what do you see in terms of? adjustments clubs are going to have to make in, in dealing with social distancing, even if it's for you know, another year, or however long this takes. Kind of, given your experience and background, how do you see the impact that COVID-19 has had on kind of how chess clubs will move forward in the future? Well, I think one thing that's changed is I think that if you had to ask chess players that play online, how many of them, for example, have played in the game, it was more than like 
three minutes, five minutes. Uh, you know, they just hadn't. And, uh, and certainly not a game that, you know, would be like a tournament, you know, limit. Um, I think that, you know, that, that's, you know, just changed completely in the last, you know, month. And I, and I think that even if things sort of start to become more normal, I think that the idea of playing more online is definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine that it won't become more and more important. Uh, I think your idea of, 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 of staggering, if you will, the Tuesday night marathon over uh, several months, I mean, it, it makes it harder for you guys, uh, but probably, you know, it, it, it might, might well need to be, uh, at least in the short term, yeah, we, we, although we're having a lot of success with online and, you know, we're having all the players continuing to play, even, even players that normally didn't play online, they're, they're kind of adjusting and acclimating because, because as, as much, and even Judith will vouch for this, as, as much fun as it is to see the number of players we get, we have daily events and we'll have like 80 players play it and a lot of them are choosing our regulars. The, the chat is very interactive and very social. So it's like everyone loves coming together and you know, interacting with each other and saying, hey, to that effect, we, we still want to have live chess. Um, we just have to figure out how we're going to do it, <laughs> you, know, but, you know, and keep people, we want to bring people together, but we have to keep them apart at the same time. So um, it might take running more events during the weekdays and kind of, you know, utilizing the space where you know, in weekdays it may not be as utilized in the evening as we have other weekends. Now, now the other interesting thing that I don't think um, in the weekend we had a faster time control than game in 40 or maybe game in 30 was the fastest, right? But now with this, all these speeches, we might have to think about offering a little bit more of the rabbits, right? In person rapid because people like this fast chess, right? Yeah, they like the fast chess, but you know, and then, you know, uh, maybe stuff during the weekday accommodates the slower time control for, uh, you know, people that love, love the long game. So we're thinking of all those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, the growth yeah. of online chess is forcing a lot of people to, to, adapt to the faster time controls. I guess that's kind of the thing that we're seeing develop. Right, yeah. I mean, one thing that uh, I think made this Tuesday Night Marathon special was, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, online that, that it is still possible to have that social aspect to it. And certainly that was one of the reasons that people were attracted, I think, to the Tuesday Night Marathon. But another was also Mechanics has a really great library and really, you know, excellent collection of chess literature. So. For people that didn't live in the city that, you know, were making a long commute to the more sort of activities you could pack in there, you know, visit the library, return some books, check out some books, go upstairs, you know, see your friends, listen to the lecture and, uh, you know, then playing the tournament. It was like, you know, it was, you know, really made it for a special night of the week that, you know, hopefully will, you know, I hope it will be able to come back at least in some form. Yeah, I mean, I, I and I think it will. It's just in the short term. I think kind of the strategy for Judith and I is that we love that we've kept the kind of the mechanics, you know, the group, the family together through our online uh, platform. And then when we transition to coming back in, it's like we, we have the group still together. So now we got to just get them back into the club and, um, and keeping that. And I, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that one of the things that's very evident and that we were able to kind of retain the, the chess community online is there's something in mechanics where people have an affinity and, and a connection uh, just to, to that club and, uh, and, and loyalty and, and people identify as like mechanics. But you were, you were a big part of that in you know, your 20 years there. So Tell me a little bit about that because there's definitely something unique and special there that we haven't seen, you know, in other places, and, and it's and it's showing in, in what's happening online and what we expect even after. Well, the thing to keep in mind is, as you well know, I mean, mechanics goes back to uh, you know to the 1850s. You know, pretty much the founding of the city of San Francisco. I mean, uh, 
the library uh, uh, got some of their first books, you know, for, for several decades to uh, the Pony Express. You know? <laughs> it, was, it was only, you know, when the, the railroad finally was, you know, connected east and west that uh, they had a, you know, a more solid way of transporting books. Before that, it was, you know, kind of catch as catch can. And uh, uh, the, there's chess being played at mechanics since the very beginning. Uh, you know, there was a tournament in uh, the first American Chess Congress was in the late 1850s, and the year after that, they had a big tournament on the West Coast that involved Mechanics Institute and several other chess clubs at the time in San Francisco. Uh, and that tradition uh, has, has you know, continued to this day, continuously making the United, making the, in the United States the Mechanics the oldest continuously operated chess club. The only one I know of in the world that's you know, been around longer is, is the one in Zurich. Uh, I can say for the mechanics is that... Uh, uh, you just checked out that book, by the way. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yes. Yeah. They, they've had to move around a lot. Whereas the mechanics, uh, you know, for over the last hundred years has been in the same spot you know, since 1909, the new building. But even in, uh, prior to that, for like 20 years, we were, we were on the same block and... Uh, and even since the founding, we were usually in the neighborhood, if you will. So uh, it's always sort of been in the financial district. Uh, the director position didn't start until about 1950. And uh, there was a fellow, Arthur Steamer, who went all the way back to the early 1900s. And he retired from his job at the, as a high ranking person in the post office. And he sort of volunteered his services. And I think the first time. It might have become, I'm not certain, but I think it might have been under William Addison. That was the first time it was sort of a professional position, if you will, and not just sort of a volunteer spot. And Addison was our strongest chess playing chess player. He was an international master, but he was really a grandmaster in all but name. And his theater rating at the time, 2490, put him in like the top 60 players in the world in the late 1960s. He played in the Arizona. Uh, he played in five or six U.S. championships and he had a lifetime for a score. He uh, was second in 1969 U.S. championship, I believe, uh, after Ruszewski. So he was, you know, a really important figure. I would say that if I had to pick one person to key mechanics chess player, I would pick Max Wilkerson. And he served from about 1980 to about 1995, 96. And it was under his uh, ages that uh, they had... Uh, a series of strong grandmaster tournaments. They had the uh, first Pan Pacific in, uh, in the late 1980s. Then they had a second one in 1987, I think, was the first one. 91 was the second. And uh, then there was one in 95. And uh, Jim Mead, who uh, later became the chess director, he was also involved, in, at least in the last two, I believe. But they were strong names like Tall and Korbschnoy and yeah. Kudner and uh, June was Women's World Champion, and, and, and Susan Polgar, Women's World Champion. Uh, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, that was really a, a golden time for mechanics. But every age has sort of had its, its, its good moments, and we've had some real characters. I mean, one chess director I missed uh, was before my time was uh, uh, Conway, Roy, Ray Conway. And uh, he was... Uh, Somebody, I mean, the stories I've heard are from Paul Whitehead. Who that. Yeah, he's, he seems to have the stories. Uh, yeah, he does well. Pictures. Conway was a, uh, uh, he had good training for being director of the Kansas Institute because he was a guard at Alcatraz prior. Right. Uh, so he, he, but one day supposedly he got mugged outside of the Kansas, uh, you know. But not while he was at Alcatraz. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It didn't help him somehow. Uh, but after that, he started uh, packing heat in the mechanics and, uh, uh, I can I can recall that <laughs> took over as chess director. Uh, I found hidden away in one of the filing cabinets uh, a couple of bot bottles of whiskey. So I don't know if that was like a, a parting gift or if that was like a secret stash as the guy dropped up. <laughs> sure, but it was there and uh, oh, but the stress of the position. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean I can honestly say that uh, uh, you know when you have a job that you love to do, it's always, uh, you know, a, a blessing. 
And it re recalls to mind uh, some wise advice I once received from Grandmaster Peter Biasis, who uh, applied for that 1980 position as a chess director, but Max was chosen. Oh. Uh, but it was good for all parties concerned because when Peter uh, went into uh, uh, tech and he became quite successful, uh, and, and, you know, really successful. Uh, but anyway, he told me once, he said, John, he said, if you take a job outside of chess, that's perfectly fine, but you should always make sure that you get paid at least double. And I think he's, uh, that's that, what it would take. Yeah, that's what it takes. You know, I mean, I mean, there's work and then there's work. You know? Right. That's the way he looked at it. So I, I thought that was pretty sound. Fantastic. Uh, any uh, kind of parting words on, uh, you know, Can what I you... Yeah. Oh, you know, that goes back to the early 1970s, and I think under Conway. Right. Uh, they kind of experimented with the format. And one of the reasons, you know, you, you might wonder, like, why do they have this name Marathon? Well, it sounds like, you know, is it, is it because it just is continuously ongoing? I'm not sure if that was the case initially, uh, because I don't know if they anticipated it would go on for so long. But some of them were really long. They were like 12 rounds in the beginning. So it could have been that, that that's why they gave it that name. Uh, I can tell you that the attendance, looking back, and the, the way you can research it is that we have at the Mechanics Library, there's a publication called the California Chess Reporter. And that was from like the early 1950s to uh, uh, 1975, 76 maybe. And in there they have the cross tables or they have write-ups on the early tournaments. And... Uh, from what I could see uh, throughout the 70s and, and the 80s, and you can check on the MSA starting in 1991 on the USCF website, it looks like the tournament was mostly about up to about 40 players. And then I started in October of 98, and I would say somewhere in the early 2000s it started to grow. You know, it went from 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 90, uh, and it, it got up there and up there. And, I think it got up to about 140 or so. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, hopefully the fire marshal is not listening to this. No, I, uh, of course the main chess room can't accommodate that. But, but as far as that idea of social distancing, you know, the other room, the, the member's lounge, it's, it's not, you know, it's not ideal to have to reset everything up, but yeah. it is a big, pretty good sized room. So uh, just thinking sort of, yeah, we that space helps. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask you one more question? So, how, how far back do you remember the Cal Chess board? Like, has has Cal Chess been? Uh, you know, what's the relationship between Cal Chess and what mechanics does? And you know, uh, I know Cal Chess. My earliest memories of it. Well, first off, keep in mind that uh, California was one state by USCF standards up until 1976. It was only divided into two then. Before that, they would have a state championship, and it would alternate between the North and the South. Ah. Have players from qualifiers from both North and South, and the players would meet. And occasionally, what they would held in some place like Fresno, sort of as a in between. But I don't recall. You know, you know, there was a lot of chess in the Bay Area in the early 1980s, in the late 70s. I can think of like Alan Benson, uh, Mike Goodall, Francisco Sierra in San Jose. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of tournaments and big tournaments. I mean, there was a U.S. Open in Palo Alto that, you know, yep. you know huge turnouts. Uh, that said, though, I don't, I'm not that familiar. I don't know if somebody like Richard Kepke might have a better feel for how active it was. To my mind, where I know Cal Chess becoming really a, a, an important force was probably like the mid to late 1990s, and it was people like uh, Jim Eade and Tom Gorsh and Carolyn Whiskett. Those were sort of the people I think of 
at that time that kind of, you know, had, you know, they, they were publishing the magazine. Uh, 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 and although the California, Northern California for a long time, it, after the California Chess Reporter, it had Chess Voice, it had uh, California Chess Journal under Hans Poshman, and then Jim Mead had uh, a publication as well. So, uh, so I would guess, but, you know, but to answer your question, you know, they were people that had sort of two roles, but I don't see the mechanics was sort of, I don't, certainly as far as I saw it, like in the, in the late 1990s when I came on board, that was not a good period for Bay Area chess. In the early 2000s, uh, for example, that was before Bay Area chess, so there were not many tournaments in the South Bay. Uh, the Berkeley Chess Club might have had a handful of tournaments, but not too many. Uh, there were a few organizers having on and off events in Marin County, but it was it was a it was a different situation. And so, uh, Richard Kepke would organize the Labor Day tournament, and maybe he organized you know, the Peoples. So there were a couple big tournaments, but but there was nothing like the situation now, where the calendar, you know, until a month ago, was you know, <laughs> to play constantly, just constantly, uh, everywhere. Uh, For the mechanics, for example, I think like our one day tournament record, we had a Max Wilkerson that had like maybe like a 85, which, you know, for a, for a tournament without a guaranteed prize fund that, uh, you know, was just, you know, five rounds, game 45, that was a lot. And that was certainly not the norm, uh, but it was probably attributable to the fact that there just wasn't a lot of chess to be played at that time. Also, though, <clears throat> at that time, the Reno tournaments were really big. I mean, they were like drawing like 450 players. Uh, they still are, are around in, in really excellent tournaments, uh, but you know, it's, it's just not quite the same situation. It was there, there were also so many more adults playing then, and so few fewer kids. Right. <laughs> well, we hope that uh, chess uh, normalizes itself, and you know, people come back playing at mechanics and everywhere else in Reno and hey, you got your, you got your yes. animal there. Well, I, I love all cats, but I'm especially fond of black and white. <laughs> is, that, is that your only cat? Yes. Usually, her, name is my, my her name is Deuce and she'll be 18 years old this August. Wow. Wow. But she's still, she's still very good. She never knocks the pieces off. <laughs> or, or moves them. <laughs> Well, John, th thank you for your time and kind of sharing uh, some history and your thoughts. And, uh, you know, any any time you, you're always uh, welcome to come on and talk about it. as your book develops, feel free to come back on and talk about it. And uh, we just appreciate everything you've done for chess and for the mechanics. And uh, and I, I appreciate all the advice you give me on a regular basis and book recommendations and all that. Uh, very much appreciated. And thank you. Well, thank you for having me and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, John. I really thank enjoy you. your stories. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, John. Bye-bye. Okay, everyone. Uh, we are... Uh, we, let's, <laughs> we have to end the uh, streaming now. Thank you for joining in. Bye.